Good evening and welcome to the UE St. Augustine Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies Virtual Open Day. I am Winner Gregorio and I'm the Director of the Marketing and Communications Office here at the St. Augustine campus. I will be the Chair for this evening's proceedings. Thank you all for tuning in this evening. We are really happy to have this opportunity to share more about the great West Indian tradition called the UE. And more specifically, to share about our Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, or as we call it, Salises, as it's more commonly known on the campus. So be sure to let us know that you are locked on and tell us from where, whether it's in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Caribbean, or further afield. So let's get started. Here's an idea of what this evening's program will be like. We will begin with brief remarks from the director of Salises, then we will move into learning a bit about the postgraduate programs of studied, studies that are offered, after which we will transition into the Q&A segment. We will also hear from the Division of Student Services and Development, or as we call it, the DSSD, and our representative will talk about the student services that are available on the campus. To our viewing audience joining us on YouTube, please feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat. All your questions will be answered during our Q&A segment. Now, Salises was established in 1999 and is named after Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Laureate in Economics and the first Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. But to tell you a little bit more about the Institute and to give you more details, I warmly welcome Dr. Hamid Ghani, the Director of Salises. Dr. Ghani? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Gregorio, and uh, good evening to uh, everyone who is on this YouTube uh, video at the moment. Um, let me start by um, offering in my welcome an acknowledgement uh, to my other Salises colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan, who is a fellow uh, at Salises, and indicate that uh, the audience will hear from her later in the proceedings. Um, I, I want to start by re reinforcing what Mrs. Gregorio has already indicated, and that is that Salises was formed out of, uh, was formed in 1999. Uh, and just to um, add to that, the fact that it was created out of the former ISER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, and the former Consortium Graduate School. And uh, when those two were merged, um, Salises was born. And uh, Salises has an active profile in both research and teaching. And uh, the courses that are offered are the MSc in Development Statistics at St. Augustine and um, MPhil, Master of Philosophy, and PhD, Doctor of Philosophy uh, programs uh, also at, at St. Augustine. Uh, later in the proceedings, um, there'll be more details on uh, those, uh, the, the MPhil PhD programs. Uh, I, I will be speaking about the uh, MSc Development Statistics uh, program. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what I'll do is I will transition to this uh, at this stage and um, ask my colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan, um, if she can share her screen. Uh, with our audience so that um, I can start with the MSc Development Statistics and then I will hand over to her uh, to do the MSc, the MPhil and PhD courses. So Dr. Mohan, when you're ready, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the public, um, what you're seeing here is, um, you're going to be seeing um, is a series of um, PowerPoints uh, that will relate to the programs that we offer and for which we accept uh, applicants uh, to study uh, at, at Salisa, this is Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. I'm going to talk a little bit about the MSc in Development Statistics uh, for the academic year 2020 2021. And I'll go to the next slide, which will uh, start the process of the entry requirements. Now, the entry requirements um, for the MSc Development Statistics, uh, basically, um, you're expected to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree or an equivalent in uh, social science uh, discipline and <clears throat> or any other discipline in which um, you would have had exposure 
to a minimum of an introductory level statistics course. That's, that's one of the things that we really need. Uh, we will give preference to persons who have a minimum of an upper second class honors degree or an equivalent qualification. Uh, the applicant's work experience will also be taken into account, uh, particularly if there is a statistical research or policy oriented environment in which you are working. And uh, this would be favorably considered, provided that the person has a minimum of a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Uh, we'll also give strong consideration to applicants' exposure to training programs, such as the demographic analysis workshop offered under the auspices of the CARICOM CDB initiative. Again, uh, we need applicants to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. <clears throat> so we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> now, the mode of teaching um, uh, from the 2020-2021 academic year that starts in September, uh, Salises at St. Augustine that offers the MSc in Development Statistics is engaging in an overlap with Salises at the Mona campus in Jamaica, <clears throat> who also offer an MSc, but theirs is in Development Studies. So we are Development Statistics and they are Development Studies. And what is happening is that the MSc in Development Studies was carded since the previous academic year to go online in 2020, 2021. And quite fortuitously, uh, we were already in the throes of preparing for full online delivery uh, in September when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. And we were all forced to have to face the, the uh, online realities so that um, there are four courses that overlap between our MSc development statistics and uh, courses in the MSc development studies. So we have four that overlap and then we have um, the, the other courses in our program. Essentially, um, those other courses will also be taught uh, by way of an online portal. And uh, therefore uh, the entire program is going to be online uh, in 2020, 2021. But this was not as a response to COVID-19 this was part of a deliberate policy shift that Salises had undertaken and committed itself to since the 2018-2019 academic year. And we are ready. Uh, we completed the work during 2019-2020, and now we are ready uh, to move in the 2020-2021 academic year. So this has been uh, in the planning and we are ready with the online programs, not as a reaction to, but as a proactive move on our part. Now in, in the um, MSc development statistics, there are two main areas of focus. One is a survey research area of focus and the other is a social and demographic statistics focus. So you will find that there are seven core courses that are core to both sets of um, areas, the survey research and the social and demographic statistics. And then there is an eighth course uh, that is an elective. Now it is recommended that those who want to pursue the survey research um, uh, focus uh, should read Sally 6023 monitoring and evaluation as an elective. And those who prefer to go the route of the social and demographic statistics uh, may read Sally 6024 demographic techniques too as an elective. Now, if students do not really wish to specialize in either one of those, and they simply want to get the MSc development statistics, they can read as an elective, either Caribbean politics one, which is GOVT 6081, or Sally 6022, which is quantitative methods. Um, the GOVT 6081 will be taught by me, uh, and the Sally 6022 quantitative methods will be taught by Dr. Mohan. Uh, and we are both on the call here today. So I just thought that I would mention that for information. So it's a, it is a 36 credit program, comprises of eight taught courses, seven core and one elective that you the student can choose, accounts for 27 credits. And then there is a research paper that accounts for nine credits. So we can move to the next slide. So to give you an idea of some of the courses, in the survey research, 
There are seven core courses and one elective. I told you the electives that, that you, would, you would need to do if you wanted to specialize in this area. Among the courses offered in the survey research specialization, SALI 6 to 10, which is development theory and policy, that's offered in semester one. SALI 6 to 15, survey research design and management, which is offered in semester two. SALI 6 to 31, techniques of applied social statistical analysis, which is offered in semester two. And SALI 6 to 11, policy analysis and management, which is offered in semester three. Semester three is a semester that is commonly known as the summer semester. And it runs from the end of May uh, to the end of July, with exams being in August. This year, it's slightly later because of the COVID-19 situation that came upon us uh, in March. Uh, we could move on. Right. In this social and demographic statistics specialization, <clears throat> again, eight courses have to be completed. And you have seven core courses and one elective. So full-time is three semesters, part-time is two years or six semesters. So you have SALI 6 to 12, Research Methods in the Social Sciences, semester one. SALI 6 to 16, Demographic Techniques, one in semester one. SALI 6 to 17, Social Development Statistics in semester two. And SALI 6 to 22, Quantitative Methods in semester three. So that's just a range of, of what is offered in that particular specialization. Um, electives. Now, there are four electives that, that we have um, defined for this. Um, and the SALI, the Gov 6081 is an elective in the MSc Development Studies at Mona, and it's an elective in the MSc Development Statistics at St. Augustine. The SALI 6023, Monitoring and Evaluation, likewise, is an elective in both. Um, the SALI 6024, Demographic Techniques 2, is an elective only in the St. Augustine program. And the SALI 6022 quantitative methods is an elective in both the Mona program and the St. Augustine program. So um, you have some choice. The electives uh, must be chosen in consultation with the program coordinator uh, and the director, and they must be approved by the director. You can go on to the next slide. Now, in terms of careers, um, just to tie all of this up in terms of you know, where an MSc in development statistics is likely to take you. Uh, it's a program for the training of official statisticians, allied professionals, and other persons wishing to acquire the capacity to undertake quantitative analyses in social and economic decision making uh, initiatives applied to development policy. So it's, it, it's something that policymakers who will have a penchant for statistics may want to look at. Uh, and the focus of the training is on the development of applied skills that will meet the needs of prospective official statisticians, statistical officers, policy analysts and other allied research professionals and technicians. So there's a pretty broad spectrum there, but anyone who wants to go into a career that, that will involve some of this um, may find the MSc Development Statistics uh, to be quite an interesting option for them. And it's something that we have been offering at Salises since 2008. Um, and this has been uh, there for quite some time. So we have uh, a 12 year history. Uh, in, in offering um, this particular program. So moving on, that comes to the end of my uh, brief presentation on the MSc Development Statistics. So now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan, who is a fellow at uh, Salises, and uh, she is also the uh, MPhil, Master of Philosophy, and PhD, Doctor of Philosophy um, Program Coordinator. And now I hand over to Dr. Mohan. Dr. Mohan. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Ghani said, I'm Dr. Priya Mohan. I'm a fellow at the Salesis. I'm also the MPhil slash PhD program coordinator. I feel very well qualified to speak to you this afternoon about the MPhil PhD degree, not just because that I am the coordinator of that degree, but I'm also a past graduate of that program where I completed the PhD in economic development policy. Now, the mandate of the Salesis is to conduct training and research from a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and policy-oriented nature to meet the needs of Caribbean small island developing states and the wider international community. And this is the uh, philosophy adopted in our MPhil PhD programs. Now, 
uh, MPhil PhD degree is the highest degree that can be conferred upon you by a university. It is a research degree where the candidate has done advanced research and has contributed new knowledge to the literature. And a little bit later on in this presentation, I'll make the distinction between the MPhil and PhD programs. So now getting into some specifics of the actual program, at the Solesis, we offer MPhil PhD degrees in three distinct programs across the social sciences. Firstly, we have an MPhil PhD degree in governance. Secondly, we have an MPhil PhD degree in social policy. And thirdly, we have an MPhil PhD degree in economic development policy. So what are the requirements uh, to get into the MPhil degree? Admission requires a, bach a bachelor's degree with at least upper second class honors and a postgraduate degree. In some instances with relevant work experience, a student might be admitted as a qualifying student to be determined by the Solicitor's Entrance Committee and the Board of Graduate Studies. And now this person may have to uh, successfully pass certain uh, qualifying courses to qualify into the final program. Looking at the PhD degree, the admission requirements are that the candidate must have completed the appropriate postgraduate qualification and the relevant work experience. Or alternatively, the candidate could have upgraded from the MPhil program. And as I said later on, I'll make the distinction between the MPhil and PhD programs to make this clearer. Now, entry requirements for both programs also require that the candidate submits a research proposal and presentation, which would be considered by the Solicitor's Entrance Committee. As I said, both degrees are research degrees. Um, uh, many students usually ask what, what are the components of the research proposal, and in this section here, I, I broadly list these. The research proposal basically consists of three main components. Firstly, you have your introduction. Secondly, your preliminary review of the literature. And thirdly, your proposed research methods. Now, in the introduction, you would present your research topic and justify its significance. You would also introduce your motivation and main questions of research you intend to investigate. The uh, review of the literature, basically at this stage, we would like to see that you have familiarized yourself with the literature and that you are able to locate academically sound academically sound sources in your proposal. We'd also like you to show how your research questions relate to the already existing literature and the gaps you intend to fill in the literature. For the proposed research methods, some of the components would be uh, how are you going to acquire the research material? Do you have preliminary plans to analyze the data within a particular theoretical framework? Are you going to adopt a qualitative approach, a quantitative approach, or a mixed methods approach? Now, moving on into the actual course of study, what, 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 what are these two programs entail? Students uh, entering both the MPhil and PhD programs are required to complete three core courses. Firstly, you're required to complete research design and management. This course introduces students to the philosophy of research and the steps in the research process, along with citing and, and locating academically sound literature, as well as supervisor student relationship, among other things. You would have a uh, coursework as well as a final examination. The second course specialized research methods. This is where the student will be exposed to, to apply the research and the actual techniques that would be used in both the quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method fields. You will also be introduced to the, the various types of data software that you would actually use after collecting your data for research. And again, you have coursework and a final exam. The third course, which is the directed readings on the thesis topic, this is a course that you engage with, with your supervisor. It's a course where you take a deep dive into your actual research topic and you present an, an analytical summary of your research topic within the literature. And this, is, this forms the basis of your examination. So there's not a final examination, but you submit 
the summary of the literature to your supervisor for that course. Now, this is where I sort of make the distinction between the MPhil and PhD programs. In the course of study, in order to successfully complete the MPhil, you need to conduct two public research seminars where you will be questioned on your research findings, your methodology, et cetera. And you would also submit a dissertation of 50, no more than 50,000 words. Now in the PhD program, you are expected to submit, um, to complete three public research seminars, as well as a thesis of 80,000 words, and you are subject to a public oral examination. So generally, the MPhil is a means to an end if candidates are, are enter into the MPhil program, what they are seeking to do is upgrade to a PhD program and finally graduate with a PhD degree. So what happens if you qualify as an MPhil candidate rather than as a, as a PhD candidate, you enter into the program, you complete your courses, you make your two presentations. At, at that point, you would then make known to us that you would like an upgrade to the PhD program. This has to happen with approval of your supervisor and the time spent during the MPhil degree program is then transferred to the PhD program and you complete your final completion would be with your PhD degree. Now the length of study for both programs for the MPhil full-time students are required to submit their dissertation uh, no less than two years and not more than five uh, years after registration. For part-time students, they will be required to submit their dissertation not less than three and not more than seven uh, calendar years. In terms of the PhD degree, full-time students will be required to present their thesis for examination not less than three and not more than six calendar years. In terms of the part-time students, um, these students will be required to present their thesis not less than four and not more than eight calendar years after full registration. Now I'd like to speak a little bit about supervision because you would have heard me refer to your supervisor with the directed readings. When you are admitted into the MPhil PhD program, you are appointed a supervisor as well as an advisory committee. In some cases, you may have a co-supervisor. These persons are experts in the field of study you wish to embark on or closely related to the field of study you wish to embark on. Your main supervisor supervisors would be the person that you work closely with in completing your research and of course co-supervisor if the co-supervisor is present. Your advisory committee would be persons you can lean on for expert advice in your field of study. And in terms of my wrapping up now, I will touch a little bit on careers. Before getting into the actual specifics of careers, I would like to say that uh, the choice of completing a PhD degree is uh, usually very personal. The person commits a lot of time and energy in completing this degree. And it's usually not viewed as an advancement in career, but a very personal choice because of, re of a research problem you wish to investigate and provide answers for. Now, with saying that, of course, there will be tremendous uh, career opportunity for you once you have embarked and completed your PhD degree. And I have listed here, of course, it's a research degree. So on top of the list would be in uh, as an academic in the university, whether you're a lecturer, a research fellow like myself, you can work at the university or the higher level education institutes. Also, PhDs are employed by the government in various ministries and public research institutions to provide technical specialized research and knowledge. Also, um, many develop international development agencies hire PhDs. These agencies include for instance, the United Nations, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, and the list goes on. Also, uh, after completing your PhD, you can go into consulting and form your own establishment, as you would now be deemed an expert in your area to offer advice. And these are just some of the broad categories um, of opportunities that may be available to you once uh, you have completed the program. 
I show you here on this slide some uh, contact information. If you wish to get in contact with us, you can always visit our Solicis website. The website is given there for uh, further information and more contact information. Also, I have the, up there the uh, email addresses of myself and Dr. Ghani. Please feel free to email us any questions or concerns you may have, and I will take it over now to the host. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for sharing the programs of study and the opportunities for research and uh, the clarification you gave on, on many of the topics. Uh, and folks, when you study at the Salises, you can truly appreciate and get to experience the regionality that is the, the University of the West Indies. Because as you heard from Dr. Gandhi, you will be attending virtual classes along with colleagues at the Mona campus. So there is that sharing and that collaboration. Now, as we transition to the Q&A segment, please keep sharing your questions and your comments in the YouTube chat. And I hope that the information we are sharing this evening is helping you to better inform your decisions to choose to join us, to sign up that application form and come to the University of the West East St. Augustine campus. I want to assure you that we are committed to your academic journey. To that end, we are adjusting the format of some of our courses and programs overall, at the same time maintaining the quality of our courses and programs. So, Here's a couple of things we need to, to pay attention to before we proceed. Folks have been asking, so let's clarify. We are planning for a September start, but we anticipate that teaching will be done as hybrid. So that means a mixture of in-person and online instruction. The integration of the on-campus teaching with the online delivery will vary from one course to the next. It wouldn't be the same across the board. Some will be entirely online. Others that are specific to a physical learning environment or exploratory activities like lab or fieldwork, we will offer a combination of online and on-campus or on-site activity. Now, for those of you thinking about the reopening of the borders, we understand that this is, is pending and the campus, like the rest of the country, we continue to be guided by the local authorities on the reopening of the borders. We have to continue monitoring and we will let you know as soon as we have wood. Additionally, all on-campus activities will be conducted in keeping with the established COVID-19 protocols for public spaces. And this specifically relates to physical distancing, of course, wearing a face mask and practicing hand hygiene. We continue to be guided by the best advice of our local health officials and uh, adhere to government regulations to protect all of the campus community, our students, our staff, and our surrounding communities. So having gone through those updates in the chat, our moderator will place key contact information for our halls of residence or financial advisory services section. But this evening we do have with us Ms. Christy Smith. She's the manager of the financial advisory services section, which is a unit in the Division of Student Services and Development, or as I said earlier, we call it the DSSD. We will hear from Ms. Smith in a short time, but first we'd like to get some of the questions that have been coming in. And I would call on Dr. Ghani and he will decide if he will take the questions or he will ask his colleague, Dr. Mohan, to, to share in the responses. So let me look and see what, actually I can, I can ask you the first question of the, of the bad, Dr. Mohan, you talked about being a fellow and we know sometimes we have the common academic language, but for those who are looking to come into the university, they may not understand fully what our terminologies are. So for the purpose of our viewing audience, can you share with us what is a fellow, the process and, and, and possibly the experience? Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, basically, the uh, academic qualification to qualify to become a fellow at the university would be a PhD degree, so a research degree, whether it's uh, in economics, governance, social policy. Now, uh, when you're admitted as a fellow, you're somewhat on the same level as a lecturer, which many of the audience would be more familiar with. So when you enter into the university at undergrad level, you would have your lecturers lecturing you in various courses. Now, the distinction is, it, this is where it comes in as a fellow, we are expected to 
not lecture as much, we are expected to have a higher level of research output. That's why in my role, I am the uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, coordinator for the MPhil PhD degree because we're engaged in research with our students. So the difference there is that you're more research oriented with students, with projects outside of the university, with um, international development agencies, working um, through the university system to influence that sort of policy debate out there based on your research. Thank you. I think that clarified a lot for those interested. And Dr. Ghani, over to you. We have a question about the programs. Are they gate assisted? Are there any existing grant funding streams to support student academic research? Well, thank you um, <clears throat> for this, uh, for that question. Uh, let me say that um, the GATE program, of course, was adjusted in 2017, uh, so that whereas before there was the 50% the assistance, that is no longer the case. But I think that there is means testing that is available. And um, there are others perhaps who may speak more authoritatively uh, on, on that. Um, with regard to grant funding, uh, yes, um, we do have research grants. Um, that can um, assist students in their work. In fact, right now, uh, we got a research grant in collaboration with the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada, uh, and they got that grant from the SSHRC in Canada. And um, Salises at St. Augustine specifically is one of the partners um, together with a number of universities around the world um, that is involved in a research on small island states. So that there is a specific um, research component to deal with small island states. And uh, what we have is a PhD student who is currently uh, completing um, her PhD and has been involved in uh, the work uh, concerning that research. So she has been involved with work in Tobago and has been to Tobago to do some uh, various surveys, household surveys, and focus groups, and so on, so that that is all funded from the research grant that we got from the University of Prince Edward Island, who got the bigger grant from the SSHRC in Canada. Um, so that's an example of how students can be supported in their work through grant funding that is available. And as far as GATE is concerned, uh, my belief is that uh, there is means testing that is available. Uh, for students. <clears throat> and uh, with regard to the specifics on GATE, uh, I think that uh, persons who are in the student, um, the student uh, academic area may be able to answer that better than I can. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think you should take off your mic just yet because I have a question you may want to answer as well. And it's about the pandemic. And it asks if the Salises has taken under any research projects or is anyone looking at the long-term effects of COVID on the society? Yes, well, <clears throat> uh, one of the things about this is that um, Salises has an annual conference every year. And uh, this year, 2020, the conference was supposed to have been held at the Mount Urban Bay Hotel and Resort in Tobago over the period 5th to the 8th of May. But because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, we have had to postpone. The conference is now going to be held over the period Thursday, 27th August to Sunday, 30th August at the Mount Urban Bay Hotel and Resort in Tobago, uh, obviously observing all of the Ministry of Health and World Health Organization protocols and guidelines for having such conferences. So the social distancing and the wearing of masks will be issues that we will obviously be complying with. And um, we are having a special roundtable discussion um, on the issue of COVID-19 and its policy impact. But there are some papers that are going to be presented at the conference that specifically deal with the question of uh, COVID-19 and the policy responses. So um, yes, it is going to form part of a research agenda, and we fully expect that there will be students who will want to conduct such research. And seeing that um, 
our institute is one that handles social and economic issues um, in the society, the social and economic aspects of COVID-19 will be something that will form part of our research agenda going forward. And we would welcome um, applications from anyone who wants to pursue um, a PhD or an MPhil um, in, in this particular area of COVID-19 and its um, policy responses and policy issues with a social and economic studies slant attached to it. Thank you. Now, Dr. Mohan, this may be for you and the question relates to research work and uh, it asks if there, are, if, there's, if there could be help to guide uh, from the solicitors on research topics in terms of, um, I'm not sure what research I would want to undertake. Can the coordinators help me? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, the task of undertaking research could be quite daunting, especially if you're on your own and it can feel isolating. At the Salesis, we do have a range of research fellows, both at St. Augustine and regionally. And we do have various expertise in, in uh, various subjects across the social sciences. We do pride ourselves in being multidisciplinary. So uh, I can advise students to go on to our website. You can start by reading some of our staff research profiles and you would actually see the um, different types of research that we are each engaged in. Maybe then you can identify a particular fellow or even myself as a program coordinator that would have um, research in an area that you think you have an interest in, and then you can build uh, some kind of contact with that person, um, share your ideas, and then we could start helping you build a research proposal. Now, when I did give the presentation and said that you have to include a research proposal, at that stage, we are not expecting a complete total proposal. It's at the phase where we uh, basically would like to obtain the initial thoughts of the students and we would then work with that student to make that proposal into something that is academically sound, rigorous and robust to um, international academic standards. Um, Chair, if you'll also allow me to just speak briefly about the grants because as a past graduate student of the UE, I do have some familiar, familiarity with the um, types of funding available. Now through the Office of Graduate Research, um, you can apply for scholarships if you're coming in as a full-time student and those scholarships would help um, give you a monthly stipend if you qualify for those scholarships. Um, if you do not qualify for those scholarships, you can also apply for various grants. You can apply for a grant, for instance, to collect your um, data. So you can actually, um, if you have to go out on the field and collect quantitative or qualitative data, you can apply for a research grant to collect that type of information. Also, we do have um, funding available for students to attend conferences, both regionally and internationally, through the Office of Graduate Studies. You have to qualify, you have to have um, something that is academically sound to present when you attend that conference and it has to be supported by your supervisor. So at the university, we do have a lot of avenues and opportunities for students, very exciting. And if you go on the Graduate Studies Research website, you will also get that information. Thank you for that. And actually that was another question that came our way. So I think our viewers were able to, to hear the responses for that. And I can move on to another question. Uh, does the solicitors offer any short courses outside of the courses for a degree program? And, and Dr. Gandhi, when you're answering that, perhaps you can also talk about if someone can look at a program and, and do one particular course within a program. Can someone just come and register to do a particular course on its own? Yes, well, thank you for that. And. Um... Uh, we have developed and we got authorization two years ago <clears throat> to uh, offer single standalone courses from our MSc Development Statistics program uh, in what is called the summer semester or what we would call semester three. Um, so that uh, this year, for the first time, we were able to offer four courses, which we advertised the general public. And uh, we were able to get um, a couple of hits on that in terms of 
um, a couple of people came into the program, as well as students uh, in our own uh, system who uh, need to resit or, or students who uh, want to fast track their degree or, or what have you. So that uh, semester three um, is available uh, to accommodate that kind of activity. So the answer is yes. Um, once we are offering those courses, we can have that. Of course, if there is a demand um, and, uh, you know, we, you may have uh, like uh, an office or, or an organization may write to us and say, do you want to, or are you able to deliver um, customized courses uh, to our staff who have an interest in X, Y, or Z area? And we can certainly um, facilitate that uh, by offering uh, customized uh, courses um, to specific organizations for a cohort of persons whom they may wish to have trained in a particular area. So yes, we, do, we, we can do that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, this next question comes, I suppose this person is familiar with the type of outreach that normally comes out of the Salises. And the question is, will Salises be hosting any online panel discussions or seminars in the coming months? And how can one keep abreast with the sessions hosted? I suppose it's how, how to keep in touch to find out what's coming up. Yes, well, well, we, we had um, a webinar on the 29th of May um, in conjunction with the ILO, the International Labour Organization, um, where they had um, asked to work with us on putting out a call for papers on some labour research. Um, they received um, persons who submitted applications the ILO then chose from among um, those that were submitted. Uh, the original plan was to have those um, papers that were chosen to be presented at our conference in May. Didn't quite work out that way because of COVID-19. So we had the presentation by way of a webinar on the 29th of May, and that was uh, put forward. The ILO will be participating in our conference in Tobago. Uh, in August, August 27th to 30th. Uh, so we, we have an ongoing relationship with them. And yes, there will be future events online. In fact, our conference uh, will um, have a component of it that is going to be streamed virtually. Of course, you'll have to get the password uh, once you register, etc., to participate. So we will be having that kind of activity um, uh, coming forward so that the conference um, in August is going to have a combination of in-person presentations because within Trinidad and Tobago, we have the sea bridge and the air bridge. And uh, the majority of persons who put in papers uh, for the conference are in fact from Trinidad and Tobago, but we had a healthy contingent from overseas. So as long as the borders remain closed, um, many of those persons have now opted to present their papers virtually. Uh, the conference proceedings will all be recorded so yes, there will be that opportunity. And then going down further in the year, uh, we will have further events. Now, one of the things that we started doing shortly after I became director in 2017, October 2017, uh, we started in January 2018 with a Sir Arthur Lewis Day on the 23rd of January to commemorate his birthday. And we started having a Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Symposium and a Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture. So we've had uh, distinguished scholars from overseas come and give the lecture. And uh, we've had scholars from Salises and other parts of the University of the West Indies presenting uh, papers at the symposium, <clears throat> memorial symposium. Uh, the first one we published as a book edited by me in 2019 called the W. Arthur Lewis Reader. What we may have to do in, in January of 2021 depending on the state of play with COVID-19, we may very well have to have an online virtual event uh, to which persons will be invited to participate. And we may have to have an online virtual Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture uh, in, in January of uh, 2020, on January 23rd. <clears throat> then we have our research days, um, started this back in 2018. So we had 2018, 2019, 2020, um, Salises Research Days, where all the Salises scholars are able to present their research um, to an audience, which is recorded, and uh, the recordings are then put into UE space 
which is the official institutional repository of um, all University of the West Indies material. So we have a relationship with the Alma Jordan Library that looks after the UV space dimension. And we work with them and we give the material to them. We also share the material with UV TV so that there is um, the availability of public airing of research that is going on. We also allow our graduate students who are doing uh, PhDs um, to be able to present perhaps uh, one of their assessed seminars during the research days. Research days are always held the first Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in February every year. So that um, that will be the date for, the, for, for February 2021. We don't know as yet what the state of play will be, but I suspect that a virtual component will be a part of that. So yes, the future looks very bright with virtual engagements. And uh, obviously our attendance is much larger when we go online. We have a very wide audience that come, tunes in from all over the world uh, to, to our events. We are also on Twitter and um, Salisa St. Augustine has its own Twitter handle. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Ganyan. You possibly may take a sip of water because I'm gonna call on you again. This question is specifically for you. Dr. Ghani, can you speak more on the de on development policy? I have an interest in activism and I'm wondering how a degree in this area can help me make an impact. Yes, well, um, we're always happy to hear from potential activists and persons who have an interest in activism uh, because the University of the West Indies um, as an institution regionally has a long, rich and diverse history of activism. And it is that activism that has spawned a lot of social movement and reform uh, in the Caribbean region. Uh, we will recall that this year, 1970, was the 50th anniversary of the Black Power Revolution. Salises was going to have a conference uh, on the uh, 22nd and 23rd um, of April uh, this year, but that had to be uh, called off because of COVID-19. Uh, and we were going to have a 50th anniversary conference on the Black Power Movement. Um, to, to discuss that. Now, the National Joint Action Committee was going to be involved in the conference. And um, for those who have done the research and um, who perhaps are old enough to recall those events of 50 years ago, um, they would realize that it was social activism at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus that led to the start of uh, the Black Power Movement that eventually came out onto the streets. So university students were in the vanguard of that particular event together with the National Joint Action Committee and others uh, at the time uh, so that the issue of activism and social activism is part of the DNA of the University of the West Indies. So doing something on development policy might be just one component and there's so much more that, that, that can be offered so that a student wanting to do that will come to the right place at the right time uh, to be able to do that because our courses are designed um, to accommodate that. In fact, there is, there is um, a, a course, um, Sally 6010, offered in the um, MSc Development Statistics Program called Development Theory and Policy. So that, um, yes, we would welcome such a person and yes, Salises would be the place to come and study that kind of thing if you have a desire to develop yourself in the field of social activism. Thanks, and as our Vice Chancellor often terms it, we are an activist university, so it's, it's right up our alley. And, and now we will take a quick pause from the questions and go over to our colleague, Ms. Christy Smith, who is a manager of financial advisory services at the Division of Student Services and Development. She is here with us to talk a little bit more about not just her particular area, but to give an overview of the entire division and how they can support students to achieve student success. Ms. Smith, I hand over to you now. Thank you so much, moderator, and thanks to our colleagues at Salesis for inviting the DSS to, to be part of this wonderful virtual open day. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and a special good evening to all our prospective candidates. Uh, we're talking about Salesis and you know, I'm thinking some stats. So 
I wanted to just start off by sharing a few stats about the UWI. You may, you may have heard, but I think it's my responsibility to say to you that just recently, the Times Higher Education um, said that the UWI was now the number one university in the Caribbean. We are in the top 2% in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we are in the top 4% of universities, over 25,000 accredited universities in the world. And I'm saying that to say to you, prospective candidates, and for those Pelicans who are also logged in, um, this, this, this was not by chance, this was very deliberate. It is a deliberate action by the university to maintain its excellence in education and through programs like your postgraduate programs in governance, social policy and economic development that's offered by the Salises unit, you have the opportunity to really be part of that pride and part of that legacy. But in every academic institution, there's always the other side. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the other side, the non-academic support side. And that is what the Division of Student Services is all about. The Division of Student Services and Development is eight, comprise eight departments, one division. And the departments are really here to support you, here to, to uh, ensure that you maximize your experience while at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. We cater to all students. And when I say all students, I mean certificate programs, undergraduate programs, we're talking about postgraduate programs. So all these students who uh, apply and get in and matriculate into these programs, we are here to support you, both locally, regionally, internationally. We are non-discriminatory, so we also cater to those students who, are, who may be differently abled. And so I just want to just go right into it from that point to talk about our eight departments. So I will start off first with the office of the director and that office is charged with the responsibility for what some of you who were in your undergraduate years who I'm sure participated in our first year experience program that allows students to maximize their transition, help them with their transition as they come into the UWI. Um, the director's office is also responsible for all the projects within the division and, of course, for the general leadership and guidance of the division as a whole. Up next, we have our C3 department, careers, co-curricular um, co -curricular programs, and the community engagement program. And I heard Dr. Mohan speaking earlier about the careers that you can have with your PhD in research Technic those technicians um, applying for government jobs. Well, our C3 department can add to that by offering you services such as uh, interview prep, uh, reviewing your resumes to ensure that it is, it is in sound shape to send out to your potential employers. Uh, they also help you to understand how to navigate the workplace. While some of you may already be in the workplace, um, it's always good to retool and so that department is there vested with the expertise to guide you and to shape you and to, to, to um, really allow you to understand what the new framework is all about. Uh, we also have within that unit, the community engagement section, which uh, offers opportunities for volunteerism, um, at learning outside of the classroom. We can never really truly get enough of that. For those of you with children, I'm sure that it will add some benefit to your life. You know, when you see, when your kids see you actively engaging even beyond the classroom, it's a different type of development and motivation for them. So you can consider that. So these are, are some of the areas that you can participate in. Our C3 department also offers co-curricular courses which are available to postgraduate students. I'm, I'm really happy to say that because I know the committees were working very, very um, hard to get those postgraduate students locked on and in on these um, wonderful uh, co-curricular offerings. So that's our C3 department and I would move next to our accommodations office. Our accommodations office is responsible for the halls of residences and for our postgraduate students we have special rooms. So these rooms are available to you postgrad students um, by semester. Uh, they are approximately $8,900 per semester. Uh, the rooms are fully contained, um, they are they uh, attached to it, you have it's air conditioned, um, it's COVID compliant, and you are welcome once you come on board 
to access our payment plan, which allows you to make uh, three, three equal payments across the semester, which eases your burden. We know how it is coming out of the COVID pandemic as well. So we have those rooms ready for you, for those of you both locally and internationally who may want to come on our halls of residence um, that is available to you. We also have our CAPS department, career and sorry, counseling and psychological services. Um, Dr. Mohan also mentioned earlier that, you know, a PhD is, is no easy feat and it, it takes a while. And so our career, our counseling and psychological services department, they are there to give you that sort of support, body, mind and spirit. Uh, if you feel that you are having some challenges, whether personal, work related, our on-site counselor is there and ready to hear you, to listen to you and to offer the the requisite interventions. So we have that type of support waiting for you here at the UWI. In addition, you would have heard me speak earlier about students who may be differently abled. We have our Student Life and Development Department, um, ably run by Dr. Huggins, who provides not only services for, for our persons with disabilities, both physical and mental, but also provides academic support. And uh, this is across the board, like I said, for both undergrads and postgraduate students, uh, but specifically for postgraduate students, um, you have the opportunity beyond accessing those services to get some financial gain out of this through peer tutoring and exam invigilation, which offers you a small stipend. So you can look towards uh, the SLDD, the Student Life and Development Department, to provide you with a, 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 some, some source of income. Of course, you would need to apply accordingly. Um, up next, we have the uh, student activities, facilities and commuting students uh, department and they take care of all our commuting students. They ensure that the spaces are ready for our students and uh, that all the concessionaires are in line and ready to give you those good hearty nutritious meals. We also have the guild office um, as you may, may well know, the Guild is uh, the executive arm of the student body and they have a voice at the highest level of management. So that's another opportunity for you to take on a leadership role when you come onto the campus, um, physically or virtually. Uh, we have um, within the Guild of Students, of course, there's a post called the Postgraduate Rep. But beyond that, there's the administrative side of the Guild, which is run um, by a Guild manager, Guild office manager, and that falls under Division of Student Services as well. And finally, the Financial Advisory Services, which is where I sit. Uh, the Financial Advisory Services offers financial aid, assistance, and advice to all students. And specifically for um, our postgraduate students, while our um, graduate school provides the scholarships and bursaries to the postgraduate students, we also provide the financial aid side of it. So there is opportunity for you to access some measure of financial aid, of course, based on an interview, um, which determines the level of your need. And from there, we can, we can see how best we could assist and the kinds of interventions that we can place forward. So that's, that's it in a wrap in a nutshell, the Division of Student Services and Development, eight departments, one division, and we're all here just to support you. So we look forward to welcoming you when you come in in September. Thank you to my colleague. Then that sounds like a new tagline. Ms. Smith, eight departments, <laughs> one division. I feel we may see that coming soon across the marketing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again. And uh, we go back now to the questions. We have some coming in the chat. Dr. Ghani, you will tell me who will answer this one. I know there is also a Salises Institute at other campuses. Are the opportunities for cross-campus collaboration there? Yes. I know um, you would have referred to it earlier, but some may have just jumped on the, the session. So yes. perhaps you can repeat it. Yes, well, there is the opportunity for collaboration. Um, in, at the MSc level, there is the MSc Development Statistics at St. Augustine, and there's the MSc in Development Studies at the Mona campus of Salises. And what is happening is from 2020 2021, um, by virtue of a pre planned exercise from 2018 2019, um, Salises at Mona is converting its MSc in Development Studies 
into um, a full-fledged online program. There are four overlapping courses between the MSc Development Studies at Mona and the MSc Development Statistics at St. Augustine. And those four courses, therefore, will be part of that online collaboration being taught across the region. And then the other courses um, <clears throat> in our uh, MSc Development Statistics will be taught using an online portal with resources at St. Augustine. There is also the ability to get supervisors for your research and members of your advisory committee for your research for MPhil and PhD students um, at the Kville campus and the Mona campus of Salises so that the cross-fertilization of the regionality of Salises is available uh, to be part of your um, advisory committee in terms of supervision, co-supervision, as the case may be. And then, of course, Salises has its annual conference that rotates every year around the three Salises. This year is the turn of St. Augustine. And um, <clears throat> our conference has now been um, shifted from its original date in May uh, to the period of 27th to the 30th of August. And then next year, uh, in early May, uh, the conference will move uh, to the Mona campus and will be held under the auspices of Salises at Mona. And then in 2022, it will then go to the Cavill campus and be held under the auspices of Salises at Cavill. So we have a fair amount of cross-fertilization and engagement across borders uh, within Salises, and that creates opportunities for both students and staff in terms of that kind of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Mohan, you may answer this one. Uh, and it, uh, it's in terms of research degrees and then someone is asking, why should they consider a research degree? So I suppose you could possibly talk about toward versus research and, and possibly the difference differences. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, going back to the presentation, I did say at the beginning that um, the MPhil PhD degrees, they are both um, research type degrees. They are also the highest level of uh, educational attainment you can obtain from the university. Why embark on this journey? Again, I said that uh, PhD is usually a personal decision. There is some research problem out there, some development issue, whether it's crime, poverty, um, health, education, disability. There is some problem out there that you feel you have an interest in and you can make a positive contribution in terms of providing policy solution and guidance to our policymakers, our international development agencies, NGOs, etc. So why engage in a research degree? You do have an interest in a specific research problem. You want to investigate that problem and provide solutions. Of course, you also want to, to obtain a research degree because you would like to have some career advancement. Again, because a PhD is the highest, highest level of educational attainment, you would be at the top of the order in terms of um, a, an expert in research, data methods, data techniques, literature review, you will be considered an expert and whether you are working for the government, the private sector and international development agency, you would be seen as that expert, that go-to person in this particular area where you can give your advice and expertise. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Mohan. Um, we have one question here. Um, are the the graduates of the Solisis, how uh, how high in demand are they? Any comments on where our graduates are now working and their experiences? Uh, perhaps Dr. Mohan may have some insight into that. She's a graduate of Solisis and she's a fellow at Solisis now. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Ghani, precisely. So I did begin my um, PhD studies at Solisis and graduated uh, from the Salesis, I, I would have then been employed as a postdoctoral fellow at Salesis. And then uh, ultimately, in, uh, since last year, I've been employed as a fellow at Salesis. 
uh, in terms of some of our other graduate students, I know out of the MSc program, we've had students who would have gone across to the Caribbean Development Bank. We've, have, we've had students work at various central banks, both in Trinidad and Tobago, and across the region. We've had students uh, working at the Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Labor, various institutions. We've, we've also had students go across to the IDB, whether it's um, in Trinidad and Tobago, in regional offices, and even in Washington. So there we, I do know personally these people, um, I did study with them and I can tell you that uh, an MSc degree in development statistics or an MPhil PhD research degree would provide the opportunities for you once you've embarked on and completed that um, mission. Okay, great. Um, that sounds really interesting and uh, again speaks highly to our graduates. Um, so the next question is, are there any open calls for proposals and what is to the time frame for academic review and publication? Are there forums for, peer to, for peers to collaborate? Dr. Ghani? Yes, yes, we do have, um, throughout the year, Salises uh, will have a number of uh, academic fora, uh, at which time uh, colleagues uh, will be invited to present at various symposia um, throughout, throughout the year, as well as the Salises uh, Research Days, as well as um, the Sir Arthur Lewis Day, as well as the annual Salises Conference, so that um, throughout the year, there's a lot of activity uh, that takes place, academic activity. And once you have uh, scholars who are driven to keep churning out the work and uh, are, are continuously uh, inquisitive about aspects of their field of study, um, you're going to find that there is a welcoming forum at Salises. And we don't only confine our events to Salises scholars. We get a lot of input from faculty of social sciences colleagues. We've even had colleagues from the Faculty of Humanities and Education who have come to present on, on our, um, our Salises uh, fora, so that um, there is a lot of collaboration that does take place. And that kind of collaboration can then spawn further um, uh, activities. So that um, Salises is going to start a book series in, um, in 2020, 2021. Uh, there is a, a, a book series that we're starting with Ian Randall uh, publications, Ian Randall publishers in Jamaica. And um, the first volume is going to focus on uh, CARICOM and uh, then we have other volumes to come in subsequent years. So I am one of um, three co-editors for the first volume, myself and Professor uh, Richard Bernal, who recently retired as the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs, and Dr. Patricia Northover, who is at Salises at Mona. Uh, the three of us are the co-editors um, for uh, the first, uh, uh, the first in this book series. And then uh, the following year, there'll be another one. And then the third year, there's another one. So um, we have that book series going to be launched and um, that the first publication in that is gonna come out. Uh, we're targeting the Salises 2021 conference in Jamaica uh, to launch the book in May of 2021. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of scholarly activity available for the inquisitive scholar who wants to write and publish. There are lots of opportunities and graduate students get involved in this activity as research assistants. Uh, right now, one of the senior fellows at uh, Salises St. Augustine is involved in a, a, a project that uh, involves Ryerson University in Canada, Salises at Mona, Salises at St. Augustine. And there are research students supporting um, him in what he's doing. Uh, so we have a lot of opportunities for collaboration and students will find it to be a very fertile environment uh, for their um, academic uh, inquisitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and Dr. Ghani, you, you asked before we started, what if technology fails? And so Murphy visited me just now. Thankfully, we had our plan B. So here I am on a smaller screen, I hope you can see me well. Our next question relates to prerequisites 
And are there any specific prerequisites for the programs offered at the postgraduate level? Yes, well, in the MSc development statistics, um, you would have um, prerequisites for some of the courses. So for example, um, SALI 6015, which is survey research design and management that's offered in semester two. The prerequisite is SALI 6012, which is research methods in the social sciences that's offered in semester one. Um, then you have, uh, for example, um, looking at some of the other courses, um, you may have SALI 6019 um, is elements of official statistics. That's a semester one course. There's no prerequisite. However, um, if you, you want to uh, move on to do um, another um, course, uh, that will then become a prerequisite for another course later on. So if SALI 6017, for example, social development statistics has as a prerequisite SALI 6012, research methods in the social sciences. Um, uh, SALI 6024, demographic techniques too, has SALI 6016 as a prerequisite. So that um, there are prerequisites and these are all gonna be spelt out in the literature that will be available to students. Um, every year we put out a, a postgraduate booklet that, that specifies what's happening for the coming academic year. So that that um, is in production at the moment and uh, that will be available ahead of our start in September. But the answer to your specific question is yes, there are courses with prerequisites and um, that is all part of the building blocks within the program. So, so let's say there's someone who has a background in the humanities and they wanted to transition into a postgraduate uh, program. What would be the transition and, and what would have to happen to make that possible? Well, what would happen is that um, they would have to have some element of some kind of introductory statistics uh, course that they would have done uh, in their prior learning. So that that together with the degree in the humanities um, would, would form the basis of entry. But because this is an MSc in development statistics, we would not just take someone um, with a background that does not include some kind of exposure to statistics and throw them in at the deep end because that would not be fair to them. So yes, if you are from the humanities, and yes, if you did have an exposure, you did one course in statistics at some point during your degree in the humanities, you'd be more than welcome. Uh, you may also be working in an environment that may be conducive or supportive of uh, something along those lines, so that um, we would welcome anyone who wants to transition that way. Uh, but, but you would have to obviously have some kind of background in statistics. You, you wouldn't just be able to uh, waltz into the class and uh, sit down in a class to, to learn about elements of official statistics for which there's no prerequisite. So what you would need is to have something in your prior learning uh, that would suggest that you have a knowledge of statistics. Okay. Thank you. Now we have now uh, all the craze about big data. There's a lot of focus on data. They say that data is a new oil. And a question here about that, what is the difference between development of statistics and data science? I'll ask Dr. Mohan if she wants to uh, uh, take a, a stab at that particular answer. Dr. Mohan. Thank you, um, thank you for that. I'm not sure uh, as to the specific question, what the, um, what, the, what the answer that, the specific answer, but I can talk broadly in terms of the de uh, development statistics. So I'm guessing they're talking specifically about the Masters in Development Statistics, which is a program geared towards statisticians, persons in the CSO. So you're gonna be exposed to various different types of um, statistical standards that you're gonna have to uphold for, uh, in a country reporting, in a country like elements of official statistics, for instance, and the other courses such as uh, demographic techniques. Now, switching broadly to um, big data. Now, big data is a particular type of, uh, type of data that can use particular types of techniques. And when we go into big data, we're now shifting our focus from taught courses in the MSc 
and we're shifting gears towards research. So maybe in your research question, you're studying something about social media interaction, for instance, and that will be big data because you have a lot of information across a wide variety of participants. And when you come into our PhD program, our course specialized research methods is where you would actually learn how to deal with that type of big data whether you're going to analyze it quantitatively or qualitatively or both from a quantitative qualitative mixed methods perspective whether you're going to use statistical software such as starter such as r or spss so uh coming into solicis these are the types of issues we deal with and if you're excited about these types of issues i would encourage you strongly to come to solicis and we can both learn from each other and learn more going forward Okay, so we're, we're winding down just a bit. And before we wind down, I want to ask you, um, to my two colleagues, what, uh, what is your hope for the graduates of the Solices? What, what would you want to have happen when they finish, they graduate and they go out into the world on a national basis or on a regional basis? What is your hope for your graduates, specifically from the Solices? Well, one of the, the, the main things is that uh, they go on uh, to uh, have themselves located in positions of influence with regard to policy making, uh, whether it is locally, regionally, internationally, some international organization or what have you. Uh, as it is now, we have graduate students who have found themselves in the IDB or, or at the ILO or, or in some other um, international organization or in CARICOM or the OAS or wherever, um, there are students who hopefully will be able to find employment at very influential policy levels in international organizations that would permit them to be able to exercise a measure of influence over policy directions and that that influence will come from uh, their experiences at Solices, having been exposed to a mix of programs, a mix of personalities who would have taught them in the classroom, whether virtual or in person, and a mix of experiences that they would have had at the University of the West Indies in terms of all that it has to offer. Because at Solices, we're not the only ones who put on conferences and symposia and fora, uh, forums and so on. The, the entire university has lots of conferences and lots of forums and public lectures and you name it, it happens within the, the walls of the University of the West Indies. All of those events cumulatively will impact on our students. And some of our students are mature students, they're already working in organizations and they've come to further their degrees for career advancement. Others are young uh, students who've graduated and they're now looking to find their way in the world and will move forward to make careers after they graduate. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, um, but the ultimate hope is that our students will go on to find meaningful employment for themselves whether they are going to be self-employed as consultants, have their own consultancy firms or what have you, or get into some major international organization or be able to get into the upper echelons of academia, whether it is within the University of West Indies or some other university, which will allow them to be able to influence outcomes in terms of how they develop young minds that will come into contact with them. So the profile of the Salises graduate for me is um, someone who is going to be very well rounded, um, having had a prior experience somewhere else before, because when they come to us, they're coming into a postgraduate arena, not an undergraduate arena. And that when they leave us, um, they must um, leave, um, we hope, with some kind of rounded educational background that will serve them in good stead as they move forward into uh, the world of work that lies out there. I don't know if Dr. Mohan will want to add to that because she's a graduate who moved into academia. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ghani. Uh, I see all our graduates as ambassadors for the Solicis. Uh, first and foremost, as um, graduates, postgraduates, 
you should have a deep appreciation for the development challenges facing our region, whether it's climate change, exposure to natural disasters, in particular hurricanes, our issues of low growth, high debt in the Caribbean, high crime and violence, issues of innovation, competitiveness, etc. So it's thinking about these problems creatively, rethinking them, then applying our applying the right techniques, whether they are quantitative or qualitative, and finding the appropriate policy solution to put forward. Also, I want our graduates to be persons who are widely published in top academic journals uh, through the peer review process, and their uh, research can stand up to the international rigors out there. Thank you for that. Showing our Pelican pride, uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, mentioned pelicans at the, in her talk and uh, for those of our viewers who would know it's our bird that sits on top of the coat of arms of UE you see a bird and it's a pelican showing our Caribbean roots and, and that's why we talk about our pelican pride especially our alumni out there so viewers this evening uh, there were a lot of great questions being asked and I hope you were able to have your questions and your concerns addressed after this session, you will receive an email from us and it will share the contact information for the solicitors. And you can liaise with uh, my colleagues directly if there's anything additional that you'd like to find out. So as you bring this session to a close this evening, I would like to invite Dr. Ghani to deliver his closing remarks. Dr. Ghani. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gregorio, for um, <clears throat> facilitating this event today. And I really do appreciate the efforts um, that you and your colleagues at the Marketing and Communications Office have put into this. I also want to thank Ms. Christy Smith uh, for her involvement with us this afternoon, uh, dealing with the eight departments and the one division um, concept, which, which um, indicates the breadth of services uh, that are offered um, out, of, out of her office. I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan, um, who is the MPhil PhD coordinator for working with me in um, getting us prepared um, for this session today. And I also want to thank uh, Ms. Shireen Ali in, in your office, uh, Winnell, for yeah. a lot of the work that she has done um, in, in getting us all prepared. Ms. Chanel Glasgow as well in your office who also has supported us. Um, so that um, on the whole, uh, I want to um, say thank you to those who took the time uh, to tune in on this uh, to, for this YouTube event today, um, to be able to uh, pose questions and to hear some of what we had to say uh, about our programs uh, at Salises. And I'd merely want to indicate that um, should you have any further questions, you can uh, direct them to me at hamid.gani at sta.uwi.edu or to priya.mohan at sta.uwi.edu. Uh, for any further queries that you have. So thank you all very much for viewing this evening and uh, hope to hear from you in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you, Ms. Smith and all my colleagues who made this happen. Participants, viewers, thank you for being with us this evening. Our session is part of a series of many virtual open days that we've done. We've done on the undergraduate side, the postgraduate, and then we did the faculties, all our eight faculties. And then starting earlier this week, we featured our institutes and our centers. And we will be hosting another postgraduate admission session on Tuesday, the 20th of July, that's next week, Tuesday, where you'll hear more about all the postgraduate programs from across all the eight faculties, the units, the centers, and more about the applications process. So to participate in the upcoming postgraduate session, you can look at look at um, look for us on Facebook where you'll see the link and you can sign up. So it's been my pleasure to host you this evening. Look out for an email from us, as I said. We will be sharing the recording and we will be directing you to some additional resources. All of us at the St. Augustine campus, we really look forward to welcoming you to our campus. Have a good night. <laughs>